Yes, welcome to the program. Uh, you know what? Yemi is still my name. I haven't changed. It's still the same. And by the way, I want to encourage you to get on the telephone now. Tell your friends, your relatives. Call your pastor especially or the elders in your church. Tell them to watch because what they're going to hear this afternoon will challenge them exactly where they are. It will challenge their way of life, their the style. They will challenge the way they run ministry. And this is just to encourage you because we are determined on this channel to make sure that we bring in people who are actually, you know, talking the talk and, you know, working the talk. So there's a lot to talk about this afternoon because I got in the studio with me a man of God that I highly, highly respect. And to be frank with you, everybody I've spoke to about him, they came back with positive responses about him that he's very special. And you will know the reason why he is special as we proceed with this uh, discussion this afternoon. And he is the senior pastor of Daystar Christian Center in Lagos, Nigeria. Somebody, some people will say, can anything good come out of Nigeria? I can assure you a lot of good things are coming, you know, coming out of that country because God is on the move and the wicked one is finished. And he's by the name Pastor Sam Adeyemi. And some of you would have been to his seminar. And last time he was here, he had a seminar in town. And so many people that saw his program here on, on, on our channel, they were so excited to see him come into town to prepare people to occupy till the Lord Jesus comes. So God bless you as you continue to watch. Like I said before, please, if your pastor is not watching, or any elders in your church, the deacons and deaconesses, get them to switch onto this channel right now. God bless you. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you, Pastor Yemi. It's good to see you again. <laughs> You know, I like your style because, you know, you're, you're a very gentleman. You, 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 you're just cool, calm, and collected. <laughs> Unlike we, you know, we, we, are, we are too rough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Yemi. It's a pleasure to be back here Amen. with you. Amen. But before we start talking, I just want to give the people out there an idea what your ministry is all about. Uh, from the material I got from your ministry, it says that, can you imagine, the Daystar Christian Center has over 20,000 members. So it's not ordinary. 20,000 members attending church on Sundays. And he has a vision. The man of God has a vision to raise role models in society. He also heads the Daystar Leadership Academy, which equips professionals, ministers, and entrepreneurs to manage and lead their organizations effectively. And he, su he heads Success Power International, which teaches people how to succeed in all areas of life through the media and seminars in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. So, man of God, tell me. Some people say 20,000. You don't look like a 20,000 man because the 20,000 guys, they have uh, extra capacity. They have what I call full gospel. <laughs> and then at the back of their neck, they have what I call five-fold ministry. Oh, my. <laughs> but you look... <laughs> You look too slim for 20,000 church. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, how did you start? How did you transit from a small local church mm -hmm. to over 20,000, where everybody in the country is talking about you? What did you do? Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been an exciting experience, I must say, a challenging one. But more than anything else, it's been a walk with God. Our church started, the first three years, it was a very small church. We were, after three years, we were about between 300 and 400. You call that small? <laughs> you know, you know, this is some churches here in this country. And oh, those, yes. And those kind of churches, we call them where two or three are gathered. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, but we, we yearned for growth. We yearned for growth because we read in Acts of the Apostles that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we expected our church to grow, but it wasn't growing as much as we wanted. Uh, the first thing God did was to clarify our motive. That was very important. He clarified our motives. Um, God asked me a question. I was saying, Lord, help us to grow. Increase this church. Then he said, why do you want the church to grow? Why do you want the church to grow? And, you know, I kept quiet because 
when God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. A lot of the time he wants to confront you with your foolishness. So he said, why do you want the church to grow? Then the Lord said to me, I know why you want the church to grow. It's because you want to be more comfortable. You know that the bigger the church is, the more comfortable you will be. So he said, I didn't set up that church for you. I didn't set that church up to make you comfortable. I set that church up because of the people that I sent to you. He said, until you help them to succeed, you won't find the definition of success for your ministry. That was a life-changing experience for me. Because I found out that we pastors, just like everybody else, want to succeed. We want to do well. And then we want to do that in spite of the people. And that's what the ministry is all about. It's about the people. So I, I wasn't... You know, I wanted the church to grow, but it was not because I wanted to add value to the people. It's because I just wanted to be a more successful pastor. And God changed that for me. So I took the attention of myself and focused on the people. These were poor people. These were young people. These were people struggling to survive. What was I going to do with them? And I began to pray. And I remember uh, one Saturday morning when I woke up from a dream, and in that dream, I saw my mentor, uh, Dr. David Oyedepo, who came with his wife in a car to our church. I saw we were in a new facility, and I saw him take a stick that had fresh leaves on it. And he planted it and began to prophesy on it. And within five minutes, there was a large crowd rushing towards our church. And, you know, they left, and I woke up and said, Lord, something's changed for us spiritually, so what do we do? And uh, the Lord said to me, you lead the church in a fast. Take time to pray for three weeks. And three days to the end of the fast, we got a new venue. And then somebody gave me a book, The Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren. Reading that book for me was an unusual experience I'll never forget because it gave us a biblical strategy for growing a church. Rick Warren said, it's only God's purposes that will be fulfilled, not your own plans. What is God's purpose for your church? Clarify your purpose. Secondly, he said, pastors focus so much on church growth. He said, nobody can make anything to grow. Only God does. What we can do is to make sure the church is healthy. When a church is healthy, it will grow. And he said, there are different purposes for which God sets up a church. Um, and every church needs to achieve excellence in those areas. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. When we looked at those five, we were strong in two, we were weak in three. Wow. And he said, the church is the body of Christ. The body runs on systems, reproductive system, digestive system, and the nervous system, and so on. When all the systems are working well, the body is healthy. When the body is healthy, the body grows. So we restructured our church completely. We set up a training system, broke our workforce into teams, and then took on evangelism, took on discipleship, took on fellowship amongst our members, took on worship, took on ministry to people who are depressed and disabled and needy. And then we set new standards in all those areas. So what we found out was something just kicked in, something just changed. Wow. Our church moved from running one service to running four services in 10 months. It was an explosion, literally. And then eventually we added a fifth service. Sunday morning, five services. It was an explosion. So since then, our focus has been on keeping the church healthy. God has been adding the growth. Whenever we get, we get additional space, it fills up quickly. So we've, we've had a good problem the last 10 years or so, um, not enough space. Wow. You know, what I love about what you're sharing now is because, you know, it's very practical. You were very direct in breaking down exactly what happened. That's right. Some pastors will not go into all these points because they've arrived, they are champions, they need some guys to just follow them. But I thank God for your life because the way you were able to break it down, and I know a lot of pastors watching right now will see that this thing can happen when our motives are cleansed 
and then God is the one that dictates the pace. That's right. I really thank God for your life. Before talking about the real heavy stuff, first of all, you uh, let's talk about the, the, uh, one other thing. You you actually led your people on a march for light. What do you what, what you know? A lot of people in this part of the world won't understand what you mean by march for light because yes. there's constant electricity. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> so what 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 is it all about? Okay, uh, it happened October last year. Uh, sometime in June, I spoke to our pastors and said, you know what, I think it's time for us to move now. The essence of the church is impact on the community, period. It's because of people, that's why God sets up the church. And outside of the church, there is no other institution in our world through which God can resolve all of our problems. I see politicians throwing money at social problems. And somewhere along the line, they find out their strategies are not working. See, in Nigeria, we don't have constant power supply. It's a big issue. It's a big problem. I mean, the average person in the developed world needs to understand what it would mean if there's no power supply to power the trains. Okay? <laughs> if you can't watch TV, if your phone won't work, I mean, just think about... And some days you can't go in the elevator. <coughs> <laughs> or even if you're in the elevator, power goes and, and then the start. power goes. <laughs> it, it, nothing works without power. Because in my science class, we were taught that power is the ability to do work. So the point is, there's no progress without power. Now, in Nigeria, our government set a target last year to raise power supply to about 6,000 uh, megawatts of power for the whole country. Heathrow Airport and its surrounding county or borough consumes 6,400 megawatts of power. The whole of Nigeria was trying to make it up to 6,000 and we could not. So I said, for us even as a church in Nigeria, the amount of money that we spend, our auditorium seats 5,000 people, the main auditorium, it's centrally air-conditioned, and we have power-generating sets that cost a lot of money for us to buy, and then we have to buy diesel. So when I told our church members the budget for last year for power supply, everybody screamed. So I said, what do you think? When you come into our own facilities, the power never blinks. The lights don't blink. The power never goes out. I said, you're taking things for granted. It's costing a lot of money. But we're only a church that meets on Sundays and Wednesdays. Think about the businesses. The average person here has a power generating set in his house. Think about the money you're spending. This thing is making all of us poorer. So I made a proposal. I said, I've observed that Nigerians don't talk. They put up with a mediocre lifestyle, with low standards. Okay. And we don't talk. And the Constitution gives us the right to talk. I said, okay, if nobody will talk, the church needs to provide leadership. So I told them that I wanted to get out on the street and to speak and to address the issue and asked if they would not mind joining me in going on a march. And everybody shouted. Actually, it was a test for me. I, I wanted to be sure as a leader if it was worth <laughs> the effort. And I saw everybody was behind it. So I spoke to the deputy governor about it. And we spoke to the security agencies. And we secured everybody's cooperation. And we printed uh, t-shirts for everyone and did probably the most organized match that they had seen you know, on an issue on the roads in Lagos with about 5,000 people. It was a long procession, but it was very orderly. And the media did a very good job of projecting what we had to say. You see, the interesting thing in Nigeria is that leadership is very hypocritical. A lot of the time, what the masses hear on the media, they are not the real issues. What we suggested was government should hands off the generation and transmission of power. Government did that with telecommunications because of corruption, which is fueled by insecurity 
and the fight for survival by the average person, the fear of the future. Uh, our government-run businesses are in shambles. They just never work. They are big pipes for draining the government resources. So in the telecommunications sector, until year 2000, Nigeria, with about 140 million people, had only 400,000 phone lines. Wow. Only 400,000 for over 100 million people. Then the government did something, just left the government's telecommunications company aside and gave licenses to private companies to provide GSM phones. And within, uh, let me say, nine years, we had grown to 67 million phone lines because it was given to private companies and they want to run at a profit, okay? So we are asking the government, look, take your hands off the provision, the generation and distribution of power. Let private companies do it. But there are fat cats living on um, this sector of the economy. First, the importation of virtually everything that the power company needs. Government officials have the opportunity of making money from that. Then the people who import the power generating sets and those who import the diesel that runs the power generating sets are making a hell of money. So there's an agreement, there's a collusion somewhat between the two. And the citizens really don't understand what's wow. going on. So we came out on the streets, spoke to the media, and spoke to the government, and I would say, though, that was not even the main message of our work. The main message was very subtle. It was to the average Nigerian who is afraid to speak out, who thinks he or she is powerless, and who thinks heaven will fall if we come out and speak. We did it. In fact, some people sent me emails and said, you need to run out of the country now because they'll be after you. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. Nothing's going to happen. You guys are just afraid of nothing. The power is with the people, but they don't know they have the power. Wow. Um, I think that's the business of the church. We are the light of the world. Uh, I don't think any institution will be able to provide the solutions for a country like Nigeria, where there's so much corruption, so much deception, so much hypocrisy, even in leadership. I don't think any other institution apart from the church is going to be able to provide the solutions. And the church can't be cowardly. We're the salt of the earth. We can't keep this salt in the shaker. And I say also, we have loads and loads of churches. If you travel through the streets of Nigeria, almost every storefront, there's a church there. And then you wonder, why are there portals on the road? Why is the political system so polluted? And you wonder, so what are all the churches doing? There seems to be a disconnect. For me, um, we are the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church. Okay? And I say that the quantity of the salt doesn't have to be the same as the quantity of the soup before the salt will sweeten the soup. Just a little bit. I think there's something missing in the potency of the average Christian in Nigeria, and we want to put that potency in there. We want to affect the political, economic, and social systems in our country. So that's why we did that. But it was just the first in the series of things we're going to do. But it's not Nigeria alone. It is needed here as well. All what you're talking about is yeah. needed here. It's just that, you see, the system here is much more sophisticated. So as that's it right. is sophisticated, the guys who are manipulating the system are sophisticated as well. All right. So different levels. You know, there are demons that are raw, raw demons, you know, who've, who, are, who, don't, who are illiterates. Then there are demons that are educated in suit and tie <laughs> who have a clear idea what they're up to. That's so right. the same thing would, would, needs to be done here. The salt needs to be effective here. That's the right. light needs to shine forth, even That's in right. Europe here. Right. I, really, I really thank God for your life because, you know, I'll, these things you're sharing are interesting. But then you did something that was quite phenomenal. Your ministry did something phenomenal. You know what? I want to encourage you if you have any contributions to add to what we're saying or questions you can send your email through to live at talkgod.com or you can text your messages to the number no number on the screen god bless you 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 did something your church was able to raise over a million pounds or i don't know how many millions 
to fix a government school yeah. and hand it back to the government. Yeah. What happened? Okay. Um, we were planning to buy chairs, beautiful soft seats. Presently, we use plastic chairs, but our original design was beautiful soft seats. And I was just asking the Lord, I think we can afford to do this thing now. So, Lord, how do I go about challenging the people to raise the funds? Then the Holy Spirit said, well, you've forgotten a discussion I had with you before, that churches raise sacrificial offerings to make churches look more beautiful. He said, but in Acts of the Apostles, people sold their lands, sold their houses, just to make sure nobody went to bed hungry wow. in the community. Wow, this is serious. So the Holy Spirit had said to me, can you raise a sacrificial offering to do something for the community? So when I was asking about the chairs, he said, no. Your church is beautiful as it is. Look at the community and do something for this community. So, and I have this passion for education. See, because the public schools are run down in Nigeria. And like the... International Christian Booksellers Association says, what goes into a mind comes out in a life. You can predict the future of a country just by looking at the school system. You know what will happen 30, 40 years from now. So I have a burden for the school system, the public school system in Nigeria. So, so we sent out a team with video cameras to pick out a school that really needed help, a primary school, public primary school. Then they went to the army barracks, not far from us, and they came straight back and said, we didn't have to go anywhere else. In January 2002, see that the barracks there, the Nigerian army has its armory there, and the bombs had been there for a long time, they were not well maintained, and they began to explode. The explosions shook the city of Lagos, and out of fear, over a thousand lives were lost one, that Sunday evening that it happened. And there was this cluster of five public primary schools. There were also some secondary schools that were destroyed by the bombs. And our team found out that six and a half years after the bomb blast, the schools had not been rebuilt. So I just took a cut out of the video took it to church. It was a Friday, and on Sunday, I was talking to the church. I said, see this. It's a reflection of the conscience of our nation. What did these young children do to deserve such treatment from us? Nobody can say it's because we don't have the resources. The future of these young kids is at stake. I said, well, we Nigerians are used to uh, putting all the responsibility on the government, saying it's the government that should do this, it's the government that should do that. I said, however, God has his own government on ground, Hallelujah. and we are his government. I said, if the human government will not do it, God's government is going to do it. If you will agree with me, we're going to rebuild all five schools at the same time. I said, you may be concerned about where we'll get the resources from. But the Spirit of God says we should start with our five loaves of bread and two fishes. Wow. And we'll see what happens. And that's how we rebuilt the five schools. I mean, with everything that they would need. We equipped all the classes with the best quality chairs and desks for public school students. I mean, those schools are now the standard for public schools wow. in our state and tied the roads into the school, you know, made their own football pitch for them and all of them, planted grasses and flowers and everything, equipped the teachers' offices and so on, gave them beautiful uh, conveniences, toilets, and gave everything back to the government. And we had spent about one million pounds by the time we were done. Wow. Even the government could not believe it because they had not seen a church do that much for free. I'm not sure if any members of our church have their kids in those schools, but I think that's the essence of the church, period. Wow, this is serious. In fact, as you're talking, I just feel like we should just 
get some other pastor to pastor that church and just bring you here because a lot of our brothers here they have a different concept of church and it's just business as usual and that's the reason why there's no respect for the church even though there are many Christians that can transform this whole nation yeah. but you know they're not doing what you're talking about and that makes me understand that you need fellowship with the Spirit of God to have clear idea and abandon your own agenda and follow his own agenda because a lot of pastors who go to God, they say, well, I'm going on a retreat. But when they hear what the Spirit says at the retreat, because it's contrary to what's on their heart, they abandon what the Spirit says and still carry on with their own thing, even though they just come from a retreat. Yes, you're right, Pastor Yemi. Um, I must give the credit to God uh, because I realize, you know, we pastors come into ministry, and for the most part, we do ministry the way we met it. Okay. We want to build churches. We want our churches to grow. So I, I realize we just do the little bit that we know to do. But I usually challenge conventional thinking. Why shouldn't it be done another way? Revelation for me is progressive. The Holy Spirit is progressive. When you look at the history of the church, you know, when the Holy Spirit starts a new thing, there's a lot of revival. After some time, the new revelation becomes tradition. And when the Holy Spirit finds the church inflexible, finds out he can't take the church out of the box and do something new, something crazy, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He leaves the church and just moves on with his work. And I have always prayed to God. I, I, I don't want to be somebody you've used in the past that you're not using anymore. I want to be right on the cutting edge. But I know that's a bit risky because it means that, uh, let's look at Philip, for example, in Acts chapter 8. Philip ministered to the whole of Samaria. There was a revival. The whole city got saved. And they had to bring Peter and John from Jerusalem to lead in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. While all that revival was going on, the Holy Spirit said, move. Move down to the road that goes down to Gaza. Now, the big question is, how many people can leave what is working? It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's a revival. The big crowds are there. And the Holy Spirit says, move. And he wants you to go talk to one person. The Holy Spirit is very strategic. Uh, the challenge I would give the average pastor is be flexible and have very pure motives. These days I hear a lot of pastors build, base their decisions on money, the availability or the absence of it. But we need to do ministry the way ministry should be done originally. Jesus sent his disciples out and said, don't take any money. I don't need your savings. Don't take any extra clothes. Don't take any sandals. The laborer is worthy of his wages. Your provision is tied to your pursuit of the vision. You go out first, add value to people's lives, solve problems for people. So money should come, the money issue should come up last. We have to be willing to work with the Holy Spirit. I have a burden for this country too, I must say. And it is because Already, this country was built on God's principles and values. And God wants to reclaim the nation for himself. And my challenge to pastors is, it's not enough to just try to build a congregation, a powerful or large congregation for yourself. It's time for us to engage the community. And the best way to go about it, look for the most vulnerable people in the society. When the power of God hits them, touches them, their lives are transformed, they become the greatest way to advertise the church in the community. Wow. God bless you, man of God. I, I just, I'm just loving you. I'm just enjoying what you're sharing. I, it's like this program shouldn't end. In fact, I'm going to just put this message through to the director. We've got to squeeze a bit. On this occasion, it's very, very crucial to just push it a little bit because I, there's a lot more to come. But then, before you came to this nation, you said the Lord gave, the Lord gave you a vision for the benefit of you, because, you know, I, you shared with me, and I was really blown away. Because you, last time you came, you didn't even t tell me about all this. I didn't know about all this. I was here after you went. Yeah. That's when I had friends saying, oh, you had that guy on your program. Yeah. He spent over a million pounds fixing a school in Lagos and just giving away free to the government. He did this and did that. That's why I said, wow. So that's why this time around, I just wanted to empty a lot more to challenge our people. Right. So you had a vision. So what was this vision about, sir? Okay, it was uh, July 2007. I was in Manchester. I was being driven to church, you know, on Sunday morning. And I was wondering, 
what am I doing here? You know, when you have 20,000 people to talk to on Sunday, there aren't many places that you want to go on Sunday morning, you know, to go speak, because it's not like you don't have people to talk to. So, and here was I going to a church in Manchester, and I was saying, but I have made a commitment. It's not the size of the crowd for me. I want to obey God. If it's only five people, I want that fulfillment in my heart that God is happy, that I did what he wanted me to do. Sometimes you talk to five people, but those five people are strategic. We were talking about Philip. One eunuch, one man, one government official from Ethiopia, but he took the gospel into Africa. Okay, so I was asking, Lord, what am I doing here? Then the Holy Spirit says to me, I'm bringing you here to strengthen the faith of my people. He said, because the whole system here was built on my principles and my values. But that, I've, that's the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom. He said, but I've been pushed out of the system. He said, I want to take over the system. I want to take the system back. And that's why I'm bringing Christians in here now. He said, however, the system is so strong, it's intimidating the people that I'm sending here the way Canaan intimidated the Israelites because Canaan was a developed economy. You know, I had never seen it that way before, but I realized the large fruits that the spies took, you know, the walls that they said were walled up to heaven, they described the people as giants, they said the land was a land that swallowed up its inhabitants, they were just simply intimidated. Canaan was a developed economy. So, the Holy Spirit said to me, you don't use logic to take over Canaan. You use faith. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 18 says, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. In fact, the previous verse says that God had to swear that they would never go here. It was God himself that stopped them from going in. Why they didn't have faith. Hebrews 4 verses 1 and 2 says, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of us should seem to come short of it. Wow. For unto us was the word preached as well as unto them. But the word that was preached was not mixed with faith in them that had it. Wow. Now you will understand their situation. They, were, they had been slaves. Slaves inherit low self-esteem. They inherit poverty. A slave can't own anything. He is somebody else's poverty. And then they come out now, they're supposed to take over cities. They were intimidated. So I will understand, for example, for the average immigrant who comes into this country, who, who has experienced poverty before, who is coming from a place that is not developed, the system here can intimidate such a person. That's right. But the Spirit of God said, well, that's my business here, that I should help to build people's faith. That's what you use to take over your Canaan. Wow, that is serious. I like your style, and I, and I, because you know, all the t a lot of time I talk about a lot of the African ministries, and I keep saying that when the missionaries came from here to Africa, mm -hmm. they then gathered themselves into a group of churches all over the place and ministered to themselves and ignore the idol worshippers. That's right. They actually, the majority in their crowd, or hundred percent, or ninety-nine point nine nine percent, were the locals. That's right. But then you hear someone come here and say, "Well, I'm a missionary here," and then you check the congregation; it's all black. You're wondering, are you truly a missionary? <laughs> What's mm. going on? Right. And, that, and it's because of people not doing exactly what you're sharing with us. Yeah. And you know, you know, we have two camps. There's a camp that says, well, the duty of the church is to, you know, prepare the people of God for heaven. Right. And then we have someone like yourself who's coming from the point of, say, we need to influence the, you know, influence the local community. So what's your take on this issue? Well, <laughs> sometimes when I hear some church songs that talk about going beyond the Jordan, you know, <laughs> entering Canaan. A and I realize people think Canaan, that's for the New Testament Christian, is heaven. And I say, no, it can never be. Because the Israelites had to fight giants to take over Canaan. When we get to heaven, there'll be no giants, no demons to fight there. So Canaan definitely is not a description of heaven. It's a description of the ultimate provision that God has for the average believer right here on this planet. Secondly, um, when Jesus was around, his message was 
repent or change your thinking, change your way of life. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I, I heard this story from Pastor Cho, the pastor of this massive church in Seoul, South Korea, the Yodo Full Gospel Church. He said when their church was very young and he had only four members, they were meeting under a tent abandoned by the U.S. Army in South Korea. He said that um, he said that he would go from door to door trying to win people's souls. And most people, of course, would listen to him. But those, sometimes he had difficult customers, I would say. <laughs> and those ones he threatened with hellfire. He would describe hell. And out of fear, they would accept Christ. One particular day, he spoke to a woman who refused to be saved. Then he threatened her with hell. And then the woman shocked him. She said, Pastor, you know what? I want to go to hell. Pastor Cho was taken aback. <laughs> he had never heard anyone say that before. He said, woman, what did you say? She said, Pastor, I said I want to go to hell. She said, well, he said, why would you want to go to hell? She said, hell, Pastor, cannot be worse than what I'm going through now. We used to live in North Korea until the communists came and drove us down south. My husband was a businessman. We were doing so well. Our kids were in private schools. Now we're broke. We're wretched. My husband is jobless. He comes home drunk in the night just to forget his misery. My children are pickpockets. We wake up in the morning. We have absolutely nothing to eat in this house. Pastor, you're talking about hell. Hell can't be worse than what we're going through now. Wow. Pastor, you said that your God lives in heaven that heaven is a beautiful place and that there is no lack in heaven, that your God lives there and he is all-powerful. If that is true, pastor, and we can't see heaven, why don't you ask your God to give us a taste of heaven here? Wow. So, pastor, I'm sorry. I can't accept your God. So, pastor, Joe said he left and was thinking all the way back to the church. He said he got back to the church, knelt on the wooden platform, and began to pray for the soul of this woman who didn't mind going to hell. And then he said, but while he was praying, he was thinking. While he was praying, he was thinking. And then all of a sudden, he stopped his prayer and said, Lord, I think that woman has a point. Even as a pastor, I'm suffering. <laughs> I live in one room. I sleep on a mat on the floor. That's where I read my Bible. That's where I eat. Lord, you know that sometimes I fast, not because you ask me to fast, but because there's nothing to eat. Lord, if truly heaven is real, why don't you give us a taste here? <laughs> <laughs> then he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, son, the reason why you are not getting good results with your ministry is because you are not preaching the gospel that my son preached. You tell people that if they repent, they will go to heaven. When my son was here, he told them the kingdom of heaven is here. He hungry, he gave them bread to eat because there's no hunger in heaven. When they were sick, he healed their sicknesses because there's no sickness in heaven. You preach the gospel that my son is preaching. You will get the same result that he is getting. Wow. Isn't that interesting? That Phenomenal. is interesting. So my point is we need to preach not just our own gospel, but the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is different from heaven. Heaven is a location. The kingdom of heaven is not a location. It's a government. It's a system of government. So Jesus brought that system of government to the people. Look, sin is man's greatest problem. There is nothing, no system, social, political, or whatever, that man will ever be able to create that will be perfect. We're looking for it, but we will never. Wow. Until man can create a solution for the problem of sin. He cannot create any perfect system to solve the problems of poverty or social hills. See, God provided the solution for sin on the cross through the blood of Jesus Christ. And any power that can solve the sin problem can solve any other problem that man can, mankind has. So that's the message of the church actually to the community. God can solve the poverty problems of this community. God can solve the health problems of this community. So that's the point. Do you realize Jesus didn't build a church building? He went out where the people were. 
when he picked his disciples, he picked professionals, picked people from the community, not people from the seminaries of his day. This gospel was meant to be a practical gospel, sir. Wow. And I believe that even here <laughs> in this nation, we can make more impact. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Wow. Not just hear your powerful messages. See your good works, good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Love is not just what you say. It's what you do. And love is one thing Satan cannot fake, sir. He has no trace of love in his heart. Okay? He can duplicate anything else. I know God blesses us materially, but I don't believe that the only proof or the greatest proof that God loves a person or is working in a person's life is giving the person a big car to drive. There are drug pushers who drive big cars also around town. But the one thing that God puts in our heart is love. We can look at the community and love godless people, love people who don't deserve to be loved and shock them with God's love and, you know, let their hearts melt, experiencing practical love from the church. I don't believe, like in Nigeria, my challenge is, how can a church be so beautiful and there will be potholes on the road in front of the church? I don't understand it. I can't, I can't put the two together, okay? And once we start, I believe that the community will see that. I'll tell you that the result in our church is we've had even Muslims come to church and give their lives to Christ seeing those things that we did because they can't understand it. At a point, some people even thought it's because I wanted to go into politics, and I have no such plan. They ask me, Are you, do you have any plans to become the president of the country? I say, no, I would prefer to be the pastor of the president. Amen. Wow. I'm really enjoying you. This is, this is mind-boggling. This is different. This gospel you're sharing is fresh. And it's rare. That's why I'm sure so many, there are so many emails and texts coming. People are, are being hit by what you're sharing because right. it's, it's real. It is, it is different from what we are familiar with. You know, it's something that's it's what I call balanced diet because all along people have been eating junk. It's just junk all the way. But this is beautiful. That's why I, I, I thank God for your life. This is unbelievable. But, well, we got, we got to just push on. <laughs> thank God. So how, how would you define a leader you know how, and how can someone become a leader okay um, one of the things that I stumbled on while trying to grow our church was the fact that there was a research carried out by the Banner research group in the United States and they discovered that 85% of the churches in the United States had less than 200 members and they were trying to find out why? Why can't most churches break the 200 barrier? And uh, it was discovered that a pastor cannot personally adequately cater for more than 200 people. See, many pastors who start young churches don't realize that. Pastors, because of their compassionate hearts, want to take care of people, visit them, name their babies, you know, do everything that people need to do. But personally, a pastor will break down once that group goes beyond 200. So most churches play to at 200. So I now learned that the way to break it, the interesting thing is I am passionate about entrepreneuring. When you see a developed economy, it develops some small businesses. Okay, so I've been teaching entrepreneuring heavy you know, in our country. So I found the same phenomenon in the business world. There's something called the brick wall. Most businesses after the first two or three years just hit that plateau and find it difficult to go beyond. So then it was discovered it's the same thing, same phenomenon. The person who starts the business, after some time the business requires resources that are beyond the person's capability. So the person needs to change. You need to employ people. You need to learn to design systems, break the job down into administration, IT, finance, production, and so on, sales and marketing. You need to be able to draw an organizational chart, create the boxes of the people who will do the job with you. You have to learn how to hire people and how to fire people. So it's the same thing over in the church. 
if personally a pastor cannot manage more than 200 people, the wise pastor will take some 20 people or 50 people from the 200 that he has and teach them everything that he knows. If each of 20 people develop the capacity to attract and lead 50 people, 20 times 50 is 1,000. With that, you scale the limit. So that was what stirred up my interest, therefore, in leadership. That uh, there was no way, with the kind of a vision I had in my spirit, there was no way I was going to be able to pastor this church alone. Myself, I had to train people, develop the capacity in them to do it. So I will say leadership, simply, is the ability to influence people to accomplish great goals. Leadership is simply the ability to influence people to achieve great goals. Leadership is not essentially occupying a position. A position only gives you the opportunity to lead. Many people who occupy leadership positions are not leaders. They are not leading. They are just bossing people around. I will also add that everybody can lead. Everyone can lead as long as you can influence one other person to achieve a worthwhile goal. Wonderful. You once said that <laughs> real money is not paper money. <laughs> it's not paper. So what is real money then if, if it's not paper that, you know, that people see all over the place? That's an interesting question, Pastor Yemi. Um, I experienced a little bit of poverty while growing up when my dad's business went down. And uh, after becoming a Christian, especially after becoming a pastor, I decided I'm, I'm not just going to tell people to give. That's not the only thing the Bible has to say about money. The Bible can help us, teach us how to make the money. So, <clears throat> one of the things I discovered, let me use this as an illustration. This is a 20-pound note, Pastor Yemi. Okay, on the side of it, where you have the face of the queen, you have written, Bank of England, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 20 pounds. And it's signed by the chief cashier. Okay? Of the Bank of England. The first time I read those words, they confused me. I promise to pay the bearer the sum of 20 pounds. I thought, you don't need to pay me anything. I have the 20 pounds already. But later, I got to realize the paper that we call money is not the real thing. Um, there was a time when people traded without money. They did trade by butter. You brought potatoes to the market, I brought tomatoes. We determined their relative values and exchanged them. After some time, people discovered that it was too cumbersome for transactions. Okay, what if the person with tomatoes also had potatoes from his farm? So what do you do? And of course, can you, Pastor Yemi, can you imagine carrying tomatoes around to pay for everything, to pay for your clothes, to pay for your house rent, to pay your children's school fees? So when people found that carrying products around was too cumbersome, they invented money to represent the value of the produce at home. So the point here is that the real money is value. And you cannot see value with your eyes. Today, I see people who pray for God to give them money. And what they are talking about is the paper. But I like to remind people, money is only a means of exchange. If you came to the market without potatoes or anything, you will go home with nothing. So it's not enough to just pray and expect God to do magic. You need to have a product or service that you bring to the market, then you get money in exchange. If you pray, you get anointing, spiritual power, but cash, you may not have. Wow, you're gonna to have to come back because <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot more. But just quickly, as we start heading towards the end of the program, um, you got this, this latest book, Multi Multiply Your Success. You say lead. That's right. What's it about in a nutshell, sir? All right, um, I, I plan to write many books on leadership. I'm passionate about the leadership issue. In fact, I believe that's the calling of every Christian. But this is just an introduction on how you can develop leadership ability and capacity 
So it's titled, Multiply Your Success, Lead. What do I mean? Okay, you can be a very good secretary as a person, or a good carpenter, or a good plumber. It's fantastic. But there's a limit to the work you can do. Okay? There's a limit to the work you can do as a good plumber. So when you have 10 people call you at the same time to come fix things in their home, what are you going to do? So, if you are smart, you will get other people and teach them how to do the job. Now, there's a big difference between one person doing a job and five people doing the same job. There's a big difference. It multiplies your capacity for success. So, uh, D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, said, I would rather put ten men to work than do the work of ten men. And my mentor, Dr. Yedepo, says, the fact that they call you four men does not mean you should try to do the work of four men. You will break down, <laughs> okay? So I say that leadership is, first of all, about being than it is about doing. A leader is a living magnet. There's a way you reconstruct your thinking that turns you into a magnet that attracts people. It begins with you getting a vision of how things ought to be. The capacity to see the future, to see people, to see potentials in them. You know, Jesus saw Simon and said, no, 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 no. They've been calling you a reed, calling you Simon. No, you are Peter, you are a rock. The ability to recognize potentials, in that's what leadership is about. That's where it begins, vision. So that's what this book is about. And I should say, essentially, I talk about character and competence. Those are the two things that make a leader. Integrity, honesty, courage, and how to develop them. And then competence has to do with skill. Uh, if you have character and you don't have skill, fantastic, great, but you may not achieve your goals. You'll be a good man. If you have skills but no character, you just have a sophisticated crook. You need a balance of character and competence. And my encouragement is it's not only people in leadership position that should read this. Everyone needs to develop leadership ability or else they don't rise. The first, uh, John Maxwell wrote a book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. The first law is the law of the lead or the cap. He says you will never rise beyond your leadership ability. That's what he said. Your success will just never rise beyond your leadership ability. So that's why this is very important for everybody, whatever your profession, whatever your line of career. Uh, uh, let, me, let me add this. I read in a book once that when you're a factory level worker, your success depends on 75% technical skill, only 25% people skill. In other words, at that low level, if you are very good on your job, you know how to do the plumbing job or electrical job very well. If you don't have good people skills, you can still scale through and get a promotion. When you move to supervisor level, your success depends on 50% technical skill, 50% people skills. So if you don't know how to manage people, that will be creating some problems for you. When you enter management cadre, your success depends on 75% people skills, only 25% technical skill. Many people, unfortunately, as they tend to rise through the ladder, they don't change their skill sets and develop people skills. So that's why I wrote this book, to help someone wow. to move up. You said something. You said someone that has skills and no character. Yeah. It's a, it's a sophisticated crook. Wow. Can you just break it down in 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what I mean is, if you have somebody who is educated, who is very intelligent, but who is not honest, the person will find intelligent ways to beat the system. But a leader is supposed to enforce standards and rules and policies. When you have the person who should make the law or who should enforce the law, now breaking the law it creates anarchy in the system. If it's a business, that business is, will ultimately collapse. You have hypocritical leadership. So that's the challenge. That's more of a reality. I don't know about how it is here, but where I live, that's the point. 
you have people who are trained to be lawyers who, instead of fighting for justice, use their knowledge of the law to escape the law. They use technicalities to wriggle out, to protect crooks and criminals. That's what I'm talking about. It's a dangerous thing for someone who does not have sound values and principles and standards to rise into leadership. It's a disaster, I should say. Wow. So we need to demand character from leaders. You know, I just love what you've been sharing today. And there's something that even pastors here, a lot of them don't talk about. That the reason the system is falling apart yeah. is because of the word sin, S-I-N. Yeah. And you said something that was very, very powerful. That even if the government does not address it, because here, it's like anything goes. They say, well, you can set your own moral standard according to how you feel. And today I was reading the papers, the government spent over 280 million pounds mm -hmm. To, to cut down you know, teenage pregnancy, pregnancy in this country. It got worse than before. You know, sexually transmitted disease, worse in this country. Mm -hmm. Everything just falls apart. Right. And, it, and the government, rather than saying, listen, we got it wrong. They say, no, we're going to make sex education better. We, we, we refine it. And the problem is because some people, some people in leadership have not been able to implement the policy the right way. And they, are, they still haven't gotten into their mind that it's this same problem. The fact that there's no standard to operate with. And, you know, because everybody can have their own level of moral understanding. Right. That's why a member of parliament will go sleep with someone else's wife and they'll say, well, there's no need for him to resign because he's good at what he does. That's his own private matter. And right. that's the excuse we've been having in this country for so many years. In the past, the leader that's caught with a prostitute or looking out for prostitutes or whatsoever resigns immediately. But the current leadership are the types who say, well, it's got nothing to do with his ability to do what he's doing. He's okay. And, that's, and it's getting worse. And that's why I thank God because you hammered it direct. A lot of pastors will not even talk about sin. But God bless you for that. Amen. And in the book, you, there's this part you talked about uh, characteristics of uh, principle-centered leaders. leaders uh, uh, centered leaders. I think you, you mentioned a bit about it a, mi a minute ago. Yes. <laughs> Can you just tidy it up a little bit more? All right. <laughs> Our world is governed by principles. For example, we have the principle or the law of gravity. See, a law or principle is a universal fact. There's so much energy, so much power in our world. But this energy or power is bounded by principles or laws. When you satisfy the conditions of a law, the power controlled by the law works to aid you. When you break the conditions of a law, the power in the law works against you. That's why God emphasized so much in his word that we should obey his commandments. When we do, we will succeed. When we don't, he says we attract curses. So there are principles that control our world. And leaders need to learn to leverage on principles because principles give us leverage. An example, if you jump from a 10-story building in London, you won't need to pray. You'll fall down. And die. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> if you think something must be wrong somewhere, and you decide to travel to Beijing, China, you jump from a 10-story building there, you're coming down. You won't be suspended in the air. You won't go up. You're coming down. If you think there must be some white witches in Beijing, I better go to New York. You jump from a 10-story building, you're coming down. Once you have a universal fact like that, it establishes a principle or a law. The point is, there's the law of gravity. And there is a force that pulls everything to the center of the earth. You don't need to pray. Principles make life predictable. See? You can even you can prophesy your future. A principle, one principle that controls life, for example, is the law of sowing and reaping. You sow, it will grow. You reap. It makes life predictable. Principles make life predictable. Principles provide a level playing ground for everybody. They have no respect for anyone. If a poor man jumps from a 10-story building, he will come down. If a rich man jumps from a 10-story building, he's coming down. If the president or prime minister jumps from a 10-story building, he's coming down. What does that mean? The poor person needs to identify the principles that will help him multiply his success and leverage on them. 
Okay, Let, what do I mean? I take just one uh, seed of maize. I sow it in the soil. It grows. I don't have the power to make it grow. The power is in the principle. God put it there. But I leverage on that power by satisfying the condition. Right temperature, right humidity, put the seed in there, it grows. 90 days, I harvest my corn. I've leveraged on the principle. I put in uh, an orange seed, it grows into a tree. In leadership, vision is a powerful principle. What you see inside today is what you will see outside tomorrow. When you now sell a vision to 1,000 people or to 5,000, and 5,000 people together see one thing, one picture. Whoa, that's power. So that's where the integrity also comes in. And then uh, love comes in for a leader. Jesus, they asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? He said, love. Love God. Love your neighbor. He said, I can summarize all the commandments in that. Because if I love my neighbor, I won't sleep with his wife. If I love my neighbor, I won't steal his property. If I love my neighbor, I won't kill him. That's the summary of the whole law. Wow. Every leader needs to love people genuinely. Leaders should not use people as pawns on their political chess boards. We shouldn't use people to play games. We have to love people genuinely. So this is what I mean that by a leader being principle-centered. It may not be easy, but you discipline yourself, align with the principles. Then you find out that naturally you are attracting people. Who want wow. to follow you? God bless you, sir. I just, you know, I'm, I'm going to go through the emails and texts. So many guys, and they, they love you. You know, I, I, I just go through. This one says, hi, Yemi. Just to say, I watch Success Power. I like it very much. That's one person. Another one says, hi, Pastor Yemi. I agree with your guest about the church impacting the society. I know some ministers who think the church should only focus on preaching Hello, Reverend Adeyemi. It's a great delight to see you speak on Nigerian political, economic, and social cultural issues as it relates to the church being the salt of the earth. I'm a faithful member of Daystar who presently lives in the Netherlands. Your influence in my life and thousands of followers of Christ through you is remarkable. I remember vividly one of your sermons, Anointing in the Marketplace. That message changed my life, not to speak of the Trans, not to speak of the trans something, respectfully, Joachim Okai. Okay, another one here says, uh, this is from uh, Reverend Dexter Femi Akialamu. He's a, power of, a pastor of the Empowerment House. He says, greetings, Reverend Sam. We all salute you, man of God. Thank you for staying faithful to the call. The, uh, you remain a pace setter. Indeed, your life has shown us how God rewards faithfulness to the call. Thank you for continuously and continually teaching us from your heart as God teaches you. We love you, sir. Regards. Dexter Femi Akinalamu. He was here a few days ago as well. Great man of God. Um, yeah, this one says, Shalom, pastors. Wow. Amazing. I feel like I'm home. I mean kingdom, not physical home. Listening to you this afternoon. That truly is the heart of God. I pray that believers, whether in leadership or not, listening to you today will start to implement these practical steps. Our purpose is not just to preach the word of God, but a practical demonstration of the love and compassion of God in our society. The Lord bless and keep you. Blessings. Remy Shalom. Wow. <laughs> Dear Reverend Sam, good to see you again. Just to say a very big thank you and God bless you for the good foundation you gave us while we were in Nigeria, which has preserved us here in the UK. More grace and anointing, sir, and, I, and love to Pastor Nike. I think it's, uh, yeah, that's Joachim. Uh, thanks, Pastor. This is a message every believer and pastor should hear. Sir, how can I keep in touch with you? I would like to have you, sir, as my mentor and spiritual father. Pastor Yemi, can you please tell us the name and ministry of this minister? That's mind-blowing. God bless you, sir, for opening our understanding, for understanding from Sister Gift. <laughs> wow. You, you got so many fans out there, so many emails and stuff coming through. Uh, this one says, Pastor Yemi, I can understand your excitement with this pastor's leadership skills. He's truly a breath of fresh air in this day of wolves in sheep clothing kind of preaching. 
I have met the program halfway and I should say I am glued to it. These are the guys we want to hear from and you as well, of course. God bless you all, Robert. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Pastor, thanks. Thank God for this great message you have given us today. I tell you, it is a blessing to me. My, may the Lord bless you, Kingsley from Spain. Wow. Kingsley, God bless you. I just stumbled across your program, and I'm really being blessed by the man of God on the program, whose name I would like to know. I would love to have this man in my church to really, to really wake us up and to help the leaders. God bless you for the good work that you're doing. John from Chatham in Kent. My, thank you for your response, Pastor Yemi and Pastor Sam. God bless you, Sister Jackie. Um, wow. Please. So many emails, so many texts. Another one here says, um, Bless you, man of God, for your great words of wisdom. You are such a blessing to the body of Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you and your family. Everyone loves you, man of God. Um, <laughs> I just, it's unbelievable. Well, we, I am really blessed listening to you again, sir. God bless you, Dr. B.C. Afolayan. My, you, you see what I'm talking about when, I was, when I'm excited about what you're sharing? It's totally different. This is refreshing. You know, my spirit is jumping inside of me, and I, and I love it. That's why you, you need to just come here. Let someone else pastor the church in Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> because this is what is needed. Thank God. The thing is that I know that there are genuine pastors out there yeah. who want to do the right thing, but they don't That's know right. how. That's right. They're like when you started with a small church and yeah. you're wondering, God, I want to grow to the next level, That's and right. they don't know how. Right. We understand those ones are there. Yeah. And then we have crooks, criminals, thieves in the system also who don't care. Mm. But what we know is that if majority are beginning to teach the kind of things you're teaching and doing what you're doing, the criminals will be exposed because the difference will be very clear, and then the church will be able to move forward. Uh, another one here says, I thank God for this great message. You are a genius. May God enlighten the body of Christ so we will be able to practice what you have preached today. Nana in Salisbury. Wow. <laughs> what message do you have for all these guys? Because they're all wow. excited about you. Do you accept invitations to go everywhere? Because <laughs> your diary will be booked from here till December. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> I speak at so many conferences, my diaries booked months up front. But I'd like to say a big thank you to all those who have watched us. Some are unable to respond, all those who have responded. A big thank you to you and for your passion also for God's kingdom. Um, I believe God, it's a, there's a new season. I believe God is moving, especially over this nation and over Europe and around the world. And... I would just say to everyone, when the music changes, you have to change your dance steps. It's like the syllabus, the curriculum for the church has changed. God is helping us to see the reason why he blessed us. When Israel was leaving Egypt, Moses told them to go ask for anything that they wanted, anything. And whatever they asked for, they got. But at that point in time, they may not have known why. As former slaves, they could be going crazy over the monies that they got and the material things. I thank God for the, uh, the prosperity that God's blessed the church with, you know, the last few decades. But we now need to ask ourselves, why? What for? To what end? Why is the church wealthy, prosperous? It's for the sake of the community, period. God wants us to bring his kingdom down here to influence people. So uh, we have to break out of our mindsets. We should not use our small minds to define this great God. Okay, he's a great God. We need to get out of the box, expand and enlarge our thinking, and watch God do phenomenal and awesome things through our lives. I pray for everyone out there watching us that a fresh dimension of grace would come upon each person's life. Each person will discover destiny, get new visions, new dreams, and the capacity to turn those dreams to reality. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, sir. Thank you so, so much. Another email from Spain. He says, so, say, sir, please, can you come to Spain? They want you there. And another one says, thank you, Reverend Sam, for how you broke down the way Desta has grown. 
We believe that God will help ministers to maintain momentum like you through the Spirit. God bless you. Wow. You're going to have to come again because we, we have to go into nitty gritty. And I learned your wife too is explosive in the area of relationship and stuff. Well, next time, just bring her along. We just want to see both of you looking good. I want to thank you so much for coming over today. It's been a, a wonderful experience, and I believe it's a life-changing experience for even the people, the viewers who are watching out there. And I want to thank God for your life, for being so plain and being very open mm -hmm. so that people can learn a lot you know, uh, from, from what you're sharing. God bless you richly, sir. Thank uh, you. Thank emails you. are just pouring in. Texts are still pouring in, but <laughs> you know what? We, we have to round up at this point. But let me just quickly read this one. I say, thank you, Pastor Sam, for the fountain of wisdom that has flown from you this afternoon. Can you answer this question for me? What is the difference between uh, principle and the law? <laughs> you know what? We haven't got much time. But what you have learned, what you have received, tell your pastor, tell the leaders in the church, it's time for a shift. God bless you, and whatever you do, don't touch that dial. Yes, welcome to the program. Uh, you know what? Yemi is still my name. I haven't changed. still the same. And by the way, I want to encourage you to get on the telephone now. Tell your friends, your relatives. Call your pastor especially or the elders in your church. Tell them to watch because what they're going to hear this afternoon will challenge them exactly where they are. It will challenge their way of life, their the style. They will challenge the way they run ministry. And this is just to encourage because we are determined on this channel to make sure that we bring in people who are actually, you know, talking the talk and, you know, working the talk. So there's a lot to talk about this afternoon because I got in the studio with me, a man of God that I highly, highly respect. And to be frank with you, everybody I've spoke to about him, they came back with positive responses about him that he's very special. And you will know the reason why he is special as we proceed with this uh, discussion this afternoon. And he is the senior pastor of Daystar Christian Center in Lagos, Nigeria. Somebody, some people will say, can anything good come out of Nigeria? I can assure you a lot of good things are coming, you know, coming out of that country because God is on the move and the wicked one is finished. And he's by the name Pastor Sam Adeyemi. And some of you would have been to his seminar. And last time he was here, he had a seminar in town, and so many people that saw his program here on, on, on our channel, they were so excited to see him come into town to prepare people to occupy till the Lord Jesus comes. So God bless you as you continue to watch. Like I said before, please, if your pastor is not watching, or any elders in your church, the deacons and deaconesses, get them to switch onto this channel right now. God bless you. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you, Pastor Yemi. It's good to see you again. <laughs> You know, I like your style because, you know, you're, you're a very gentleman. You, 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 you're just cool, calm, and collected. <laughs> Unlike we, you know, we, we, are, we are too rough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Yemi. It's a pleasure to be back here Amen. with you. Amen. But before we start talking, I just want to give the people out there an idea what your ministry is all about. Uh, from the material I got from your ministry, it says that, can you imagine, the Daystar Christian Center has over 20,000 members. So it's not ordinary. 20,000 members attending church on Sundays. And he has a vision. You want to be more comfortable. You know that the bigger the church is, the more comfortable you will be. So he said, I didn't set up that church for you. I didn't set that church up to make you comfortable. I set that church up because of the people that I sent to you. He said, until you help them to succeed, you won't find the definition of success for your ministry. That was a life-changing experience for me because I found out that we pastors, just like everybody else, want to succeed, we want to do well. And then we want to do that in spite of the people. And that's what the ministry is all about. It's about the people. So I, I wasn't, you know, I wanted the church to grow, but it was not because I wanted to add value to the people. It's because I just wanted to be a more successful pastor. And God changed that for me. So I took the attention of myself and focused on the people. These were poor people. These were young people. These were people struggling to survive. What was I going to do with them? And I began to pray. And I remember uh, 
one Saturday morning when I woke up from a dream, and in that dream I saw my mentor, uh, Dr. David Oyedepo, who came with his wife in a car to our church. I saw we were in a new facility, and I saw him take a stick that had fresh leaves on it, and he planted it and began to prophesy on it. And within five minutes, there was a large crowd rushing towards our church. And you know, they left, and I woke up and said, Lord, something's changed for us spiritually, so what do we do? And uh, the Lord said to me, you lead the church in a fast. Take time to pray for three weeks, and three days to the end of the fast, we got a new venue, and then somebody gave me a book, The Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren. Reading that book for me was an unusual experience I'll never forget because it gave us a biblical strategy for growing a church. Rick Warren said, it's only God's purposes that will be fulfilled, not your own plans. What is God's purpose for your church? Clarify your purpose. Secondly, he said, pastors focus so much on church growth. He said, nobody can make anything to grow. Only God does. What we can do is to make sure the church is healthy. When the church is healthy, it will grow. And he said, there are different purposes for which God sets up a church. Um, and every period, it's because of people, that's why God sets up the church. And outside of the church, there is no other institution in our world through which God can resolve all of our problems. I see politicians throwing money at social problems. And somewhere along the line, they find out their strategies are not working. See, in Nigeria, we don't have constant power supply. It's a big issue. It's a big problem. I mean, the average person in the developed world needs to understand what it would mean if there's no power supply to power the trains. OK? <laughs> if you can't watch TV, if your phone won't work, I mean, just think about... And some days you can't go in the elevator. <coughs> <laughs> or even if you're in the elevator, power goes and, and then the start. power goes. <laughs> it, it, nothing works without power. Because in my science class, we were taught that power is the ability to do work. So the point is, there's no progress without power. Now, in Nigeria, our government set a target last year to raise power supply to about 6,000 uh, megawatts of power for the whole country. Heathrow Airport and its surrounding county or borough consumes 6,400 megawatts of power. The whole of Nigeria was trying to make it up to 6,000, and we could not. So I said, for us even as a church in Nigeria, the amount of money that we spend, our auditorium seats 5,000 people, the main auditorium, it's centrally air-conditioned, and we have power-generating sets that cost a lot of money for us to buy. And then we have to buy diesel. So when I told our church members the budget for last year for power supply, everybody screamed. So I said, what do you think? When you come into our own facilities, the power never blinks. The lights don't blink. The power never goes out. I said, you're taking things for granted. It's costing a lot of money. But we're only a church that meets on Sundays and Wednesdays. Think about the businesses. The average person here has a power generating set in his house. Think about the money you're spending. This thing is making all of us poorer. So I made a proposal. I said, I've observed that Nigerians don't talk. They put up with a mediocre lifestyle, with low standards. Okay. And we don't talk. And the constitute The man of God has a vision to raise role models in society. He also heads the Daystar Leadership Academy, which equips professionals, ministers, and entrepreneurs to manage and lead their organizations effectively. And he, su he heads Success Power International, which teaches people how to succeed in all areas of life through the media and seminars in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. So, man of God, tell me. Some people say 20,000. You don't look like a 20,000 man because the 20,000 guys, they have uh, extra capacity. 
they have what I call full gospel. <laughs> and then at the back of their neck, they have what I call five-fold ministry. Oh, my. <laughs> but you look, <laughs> you look too slim for 20,000 church. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, how did you start? How did you transit from a small local church to over 20,000, where everybody in the country is talking about you? What did you do? Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been an exciting experience, I must say, a challenging one, but more than anything else, it's been a work with God. Our church started, the first three years, it was a very small church. We were, after three years, we were about between 300 and 400. You call that small? <laughs> you want know, to visit some churches here in this country. And oh, those, yes. And those kind of churches, we call them where two or three are gathered. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, but we, we yearned for growth. We yearned for growth because we read in Acts of the Apostles that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we expected our church to grow, but it wasn't growing as much as we wanted. Uh, the first thing God did was to clarify our motive. That was very important. He clarified our motives. Um, God asked me a question. I was saying, Lord, help us to grow. Increase this church. Then he said, why do you want the church to grow? Why do you want the church to grow? And you know, I kept quiet because when God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. A lot of the time he wants to confront you with your foolishness. So he said, why do you want the church to grow? Then the Lord said to me, I know why you want the church to grow. It's because your church needs to achieve excellence in those areas. Worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. When we looked at those five, we were strong in two, we were weak in three. Wow. And he said, the church is the body of Christ. The body runs on systems, reproductive system, digestive system, and the nervous system, and so on. When all the systems are working well, the body is healthy. When the body is healthy, the body grows. So we restructured our church completely. We set up a training system, broke our workforce into teams, and then took on evangelism, took on discipleship, took on fellowship amongst our members, took on worship, took on ministry to people who are depressed and disabled and needy. And then we set new standards in all those areas. So what we found out was something just kicked in, something just changed. Wow. Our church moved from running one service to running four services in 10 months. It was an explosion, literally. And then eventually we added a fit service. Sunday morning, five services. It was an explosion. So since then, our focus has been on keeping the church healthy. God has been adding the growth. Whenever we get, we get additional space, it fills up quickly. So we've, we've had a good problem the last 10 years or so. Um, not enough space. Wow. You know what I love about what you're sharing now is because, you know, it's very practical. You were very direct in breaking down exactly what happened. That's right. Some pastors will not go into all these points because they've arrived, they're champions, they need some guys to just follow them. But I thank God for your life because the way you were able to break it down. And I know a lot of pastors watching right now will see that this thing can happen when our motives are cleansed and then God is the one that dictates the pace. That's right. I really thank God for your life. Before talking about the real heavy stuff, first of all, you, uh, let's talk about the, the, uh, one other thing. You, you actually led your people on a march for light. What you, what, what, you know, a lot of people in this part of the world won't understand what you mean by March for Light because yes. there's constant electricity. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so what, what's, what is it all about? Okay, uh, it happened October last year. At uh, some time in June, I spoke to our pastors and said, you know what, I think it's time for us to move now. The essence of the church is impact on the community.